Welcome to the Marley Bird YouTube channel brought to you by Red Heart Yarns. In this video, I am going to share with you my 10 secrets to perfect planned pooling. I'm here in my on location studio at my mom's house filming holiday videos and I'm working on this really great holiday inspired planned pooling project. And it got me to thinking, Marley, you have 10 things that you make sure that you do on every single pooling project. Why don't you share those with everybody else and call them the secrets to perfect plan pooling? Hence, we have a video. Now, before you get started in this video, if you're looking for the basic instructions for planned pooling, you are gonna wanna check out the video I have right over there. It's the best crochet tutorial for planned pooling Argyle out there. I promise you, once you view that and get started, you're gonna start making some really great pooling projects. But as you move forward and you're like, you know there's a couple things that I'd like to know a little bit more about, I am going to fill in those blanks now. That's where the 10 secrets jump in. Are you ready? Here we go. Secret number one is you want to make sure that you chain through a full color sequence. It doesn't matter where you begin with your slip knot. I'll just put a slip knot right here in the middle of this black portion of the Red Heart Super Saver Zebra. And the biggest thing I want to make sure is that when I stop my chaining process, that I have gone through one full color sequence. And I mentioned one full color sequence, that's if you're making about the width of a scarf and you wanna get a nice full range of the colors. If you're looking for a zigzag, of course, you'd, you'd alter that up a little bit, but for the basic scarf, for the basic full um, range of color combinations, you wanna get through one full color sequence. As I set this down, you will notice that not only did I go through one full color sequence, but I did a little bit extra. The reason I did that is because I did not start at any particular beginning point. So if I started right here in the black, I would start counting my color sequence, maybe right here where the black and silver begin to separate. So as I go through, I can see silver, white, silver, black, and I'm back to silver, which this silver here matches up with this. So if I were to line this up and we were to go in a circle, this is where my color change would begin. Okay, so this is, would be my sequence. So I went a little bit beyond my sequence, so that way I can make sure I have gone through a full color sequence. That leads me to secret number two, which is planning where your colors are gonna go in your actual scarf. As we spread this out, we can begin to see that if we continue our color sequence here and we want to maybe have the black right into the middle, we would want to start our color sequence right here at this point because that puts the black roughly in the center. If we wanted to have the black on the outsides, I could continue on and make the black on the outside by starting right here and then go right there, or even work a few stitches into the black on either side and split up that black section. It's a little bit fiddly and something you can play around with, but at least you know it is possible. You can plan where you want your colors to land. That leads me to secret number three, which is working around your beginning chains versus working into them. Let me show you what I mean. If you're working in moss stitch, you know you begin working back on your chains when the color changes from your last color of your color sequence to your next color. You would do a single crochet in the fourth chain from hook, so we will do that. We'll place that first one directly into the chain, but all of our next ones, we will actually work around this beginning chain. So simply take your hook, go underneath the chain, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, draw through two. Chain one, go under the chain, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through. Pretty cool, right? Remember to always put that first stitch in the chain because that locks the chain in place. But all your remaining stitches, you will work around the chain. And what are the benefits of doing that? One, you're able to actually shift and move and make either wider or more tight your row one. So that way it allows your row one stitches to fall in line with the rest of the body of your scarf. It just makes it a lot more uniform for the whole project. 
The other thing is that it will really help you out with secret number four. Secret number four is this. As you are making your stitches around your chain, you want to strive to get a consistent number of stitches in each color. Meaning right here at this start, I just got one, two, three stitches, because you want to make sure you count the one you put into the chain, in the gray color. So I would go ahead and I would mark that down that I got three stitches in that gray. I'm on to the white and let's see how many stitches I can get in the white. And I want to make sure that I do not get any half color stitches, meaning I don't want any stitches where one leg is white and one leg is gray. I wanna make sure I get full stitches here. So I am just going along. I'm not really concerned about the tension. I'm trying to keep it pretty consistent and I'm just moving along and I will see here at the end how many stitches I get in my white. Now right here I can see that my gray is about to start. So let's count how many stitches I have in my white. I have one, two, three in gray. So I have one, two, three, four, five single crochets in my white. So I would go ahead and write that down. I would move on to my gray section now, and this gray is wholly independent of this gray. So if this one happens to get four instead of three, that's okay, but for symmetry reasons and because I like to have things even up, I'm gonna try and get three stitches out of this gray also. So let's see what I can do here. I can get one and two, and, oh gosh, that one I have half and half. So what I could do here is I would go ahead and I'd rip those out and let's see if I can make them just a little bit more snug so that I could get my three stitches. So I'll get one and two and three. Look at that, I can get my three gray. That's awesome, so I have three gray, five white, three gray, and it's time to move on to the black. So let's see how many of the black I can get. So there's one, two, three, ooh, chain wants to go around, four, five, let's get some more yarn here, six, seven, eight, it's a lot. And if I do this one, I'm getting half and half. I'm sort of in the gray, sort of in the black. So I think I'm gonna stick with the gray, the, the eight I have there. But what I will do is I will just loosen up these last two to make sure I eat up that gray a little bit, or not gray, the black a little bit more, just so that I'm in the correct placement. So let's count here. I know it's probably hard to see. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have eight single crochets completed in the black, which is great. So I can set this down and I, I have three gray, five white, three gray, eight black. The benefit of knowing the number of stitches you're getting in each color is that you can maintain that same number throughout the body of your pattern. So now your roll one will look exactly like the rest of your pattern. It won't be off kilter and it won't be that you have to get several rows in before your work starts to really take shape. So then you have this blob at the beginning but then everything else looks like argyle. Your very first row now sets up your work for the rest of your project. You are now set for success. The biggest things to take away from secret number four are these. Make sure you have no half color stitches. Every stitch, every single crochet should be its own color. You also want to remember that even though you might have two of the same color in your color sequence, that does not mean that this gray has to be the same number of this gray. It could be that this one has two and this one has three. That would be okay, and the reason it's okay is because there are some yarns out there with the dye lots that make that happen. So just because the yarn you use might get three and three this time, it could be that as you use the same color yarn but a different dye lot later, you get a different number of stitches in those points. 
or if you're using a different hook size, you could get a different number of stitches. So it's okay. So just remember that even though you might have two of the same color, they are wholly independent colors. So they should each have their own number of stitches. Of course, I like mine even, so I made mine three and three. The last thing to remember is that it's best if you can at least get two stitches in each color. And when I say at least, that means if it happens that you have to only get one stitch out of one of the colors in a sequence, so be it. But if you're working with the yarn where you're only getting one color per stitch throughout the entire color sequence, that's gonna make it really difficult to pull and chances are it's just not gonna work out. So do yourself a favor and pick a yarn where you get at least, at least two stitches per color. I prefer to get at least four. I really prefer four, but um, having at least two will work. Let's talk about secret number four a little bit more. As I turn my work and begin row two, I want to start counting the number of stitches I have in each color as established in row one. Remember, I had three gray, so as long as I start off here with my three gray, I know I'm on track, and I did, I have my three gray. I move along and I wanna make sure I get my five white. So I will just move along here and see if I can get my five white. If for some reason I am coming up one too short or one too many, I can rip out just the white section and make those stitches looser or tighter to adjust what color lands in what place. You see how this works out? So I'm getting one, two, three, four, five white. That leads me to secret number five, which is this. It is very important that you get the correct color to land in the correct stitch. It is more important than your gauge or your tension. So right here, I just mentioned that if you are coming up a stitch short or a stitch too many, you can either loosen or tighten your stitches. As you take a look down here, you can see I switched this up and I made it so that I got a little bit more gray in this stitch than I wanted, which would make it so that I'm only getting four white, which is not exactly what I want. I want five, because that's how many I got in my row one. So I would rip out my work just to the white, all right? So just to the white section. And what I'm gonna do is I will tighten those stitches so that way I have more white available when I get to the fifth white stitch. So there's one and single crochet chain one. Here's number three. And then here's number four. And then when I get to this last one, now that I've tightened those stitches up by making them a little bit more snug, I am perfect in my color placement because I have one, two, three, four, five whites where I want them, which is perfect. And I can carry on and I wanna make sure I get three gray. So there's one and two and look at this this is a good example check it out if i do my third gray i'm to my black well remember when we did the gray over here i came up a little short too and i need to tighten it up so it might be that throughout the entire project i will have to tighten up those gray ones a little bit more to make sure i get three and the reason i did that is because i really like the idea of keeping the grays the same number but if I wanted to go back and just make those two stitches, I could absolutely do that. So here I am, I tightened it up, and I have my three grays like I want. I would carry on and I would make sure that I get my eight black. So there's one, two, three, and four. Oops, let's get this here. Four. five, make sure I'm in between, six, and the last one would be seven, and my chain twos for my turn would count as my number eight, okay? So I am landing in the correct place. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about secret number two again. Remember when I mentioned that secret number two of working around your chains allows you to adjust your work a little bit? Check this out. Right now, my work, as I set it down, it wants to kind of cup in on itself. Like these are a little bit too snug. But because I put them on the chain, rather in the chain, I can scooch them out a little bit, give them a little space, and allow them to be the size they need to be 
to coordinate with the rest of the body of the scarf as it's starting to establish itself. See how that works out? So it allows my stitches to really be in the correct place. And my chain stays in place because of my very first stitch that I did down here in the chain. See how pretty that is? The other benefit of this, as I mentioned before, is that because we were able to count the number of stitches in each color and establish that here on row one, we have already set ourselves up for success in future rows because we are maintaining that same stitch count and it will allow our work to shift as our stitches shift over by one on the diagonal every other row. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so we're gonna go back to secret number five because this is where it starts to take place even more so. As I turn my work and begin row three, we're gonna talk about secret number five some more because again, it has to do with color placement. And as I'm starting on row three, this is where I will begin to know if my work is really starting to take shape and become the argyle I need it to be. So what I will need to do is as I complete this first stitch here, my next stitch, which will go right here, will need to also be gray, okay? It's gonna need to be gray. And I can tell right here, look, that's kind of a bit of yarn. So I'm gonna make sure that I make my stitch a little bit loose to try and eat up the amount of yarn I need. Perfect. So I've used my single crochet right there at the beginning. And I can see right here, here is my silver. I'll put it right here and there I am. So this is starting off my argyle. Now I wanna make sure that I keep the three silver stitches just like I established in row one. So here's two, and then here is three. Is that two half and half? I would consider this one, it's probably hard to tell you guys, but this leg is a little bit more white than I would like it to be. So once again, I would go back and I'm just gonna rip back a few stitches in my silver just to tighten them up a little bit so that way I get a full silver stitch, okay? You don't want any half colors, remember? Secret number four requires you to get a full stitch. So now I have my three silvers and I'm ready to carry on to make sure I get my five white. So far so good, you ready for secret number six? Secret number six is one that you probably already know. It is important that you have a plethora of hook sizes with you as you're working on your project. Cause it could be that as you're working along that you will need to change hook sizes in the middle of the project to make sure that your stitches are coming out correctly. As I'm working along, I'm using my J hook or my six millimeter hook, but maybe as I start getting a little bit more tense or a little bit more loose through my project, whatever it may be, I need to change hook sizes to make sure that I get the right color in the right place. So right here I have one, two, three, four, and then I'm already starting to get silver in my fifth one. So I can rip this out. I'm gonna rip out back here to the white, and maybe it just is that this is too big of a hook and I need to go down a hook size. So I will go down to my size five and a half millimeter, which is also my size I, and I can carry on with this hook. And let's see if that makes it easier. So rather than trying to tighten the stitches on that bigger hook, I just shift down to a smaller hook size and see if that helps me get to the correct color placement I need, which is what is super important, correct? So now I have one, two, three, four, chain one, and this would be my deciding factor, and perfect. So I'm getting that stitch I need. Well, I could go ahead and carry on and see if maybe I need to use this hook size instead of the other. Maybe that's what needs to happen. I don't know, who knows? Well, right there, I got one, two, and if I do my third, I'm already into the black. So I would have to tweak this. The point of this goes back to secret number five. The color of the stitch is more important than the gauge of the stitch. So if you need to use different hook sizes to get the stitch color the correct color you need it to be, you can do that. I know those of you out there who have been crocheting for many, many years are like, wait a minute, what do you mean you're gonna change hook size mid-row, mid-stitch, whatever it may be. It is contrary to everything you have been taught in crochet. I know that. But the point here is that you're doing a new technique that it is vital you have the correct stitch in the correct place. If you are even off half of a stitch, 
you will be off in your pattern. It won't be as crisp and clean as you want it to be. That's why in secret number four, I mentioned you want full stitches in those colors. You don't want half stitches, okay? Sometimes it could be that you have to do a different stitch instead of just a different hook. And that leads us to secret number seven. Secret number seven is this. There will be times that you will have to adjust the number of turning chains at the beginning of your row. It could be that you only need one chain to make the subsequent colors land in place. You might need the recommended two. You might even need three. You can totally adjust this number as necessary so that way it helps you maintain the correct color placement in your work. If you decide, you know what, I'm gonna maintain two, but I need to change the stitches I will use as I do my work. Here's a good example of what you could do. Right here at the start of this turn, I need to begin with a black. And as I chain one, and I look to my next stitch, which will be placed right there, I can see as I go on the diagonal that it needs to be silver, right? It needs to be that gray color. But if I complete this stitch, I'm still in the black, okay? So something needs to happen here. Either I make this stitch larger or I add stitches here or I rip out completely and make these stitches larger to eat up more yarn to get to the silver. Or one thing I could do is because I'm just about this much off. Can you see that? So what I will do is I'm gonna rip back to the first stitch here. So I have my chain two turn that I did and I will do a half double crochet instead of my single crochet in that first stitch. Let's do a chain one and let's see where that lands me. Shoot, I'm still in my, my black, all right? Well, this would work. Sometimes this works, just doing the half double crochet works. But if that one doesn't work, you could go back and you could do a half double crochet and then you could do a slip stitch into that same stitch. So I'm going into that stitch and just doing a slip stitch and then chain one, and I can come over here and let's see, oh, I'm closer. That's closer, I'm getting a little bit of gray, so hmm, maybe that one won't work. I'll, I'll put that one down as, all right, that won't work on this particular stitch, but maybe it will work for future stitches. Well, what I could do now is instead of doing the half double crochet at all, what if I do sort of a partial, partial puff stitch? So let's go into the stitch, yarn over, pull up a loop, Yarn over our hook, go into the stitch, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over our hook and draw through all of those. All right, so it's, it's sort of like a puff stitch. Let's see what I get here. I don't think this one's going to work either. Oh, it's so close. It's super close. Given that I've tried all three of those methods where I've done the half double, I've done the half double with the slip stitch, which you could also do with the single crochet and then do a slip stitch, and I've done the puff, my last resort here would be to rip out all the way down to the previous row, and I'm gonna make those stitches a little bit bigger than what they were originally. Usually, this is what I'll have to do at the end of a row because I have a hard time gauging how big these stitches need to be before I do my turn. So, it's very common to have to rip down to the previous row through that color sequence to get the correct tension on those stitches, okay? And I'm just making them a little bit bigger here. And then when I get to the end, I'll do my chain two, I'll turn my work, and I'll start once again, just like I was supposed to start, and then make adjustments from there if I need to. So I did my single crochet, and I'm coming up short, but my guess here is that if I did a half double crochet, it will come out perfect this time, but let's see. So I'm doing my half double crochet, chain one, and look, I am to the silver, which is what I want it to be. So if you need to change actual stitches along with the tension of the stitch to get the color in the correct place, you need to do that, you can do that, and it will enable you to have perfect planned pooling. Secret number eight is this. As you're adding a new ball of yarn to your project, you wanna make sure that your dye lot is exactly the same. This will enable you to better maintain the same number of stitches in each color and hopefully get the same tension throughout your entire project. 
If you don't have the same die lot, it is a little bit more fiddly and almost impossible to maintain the same number of stitches in each color and to maintain the same sequence of the argyle pattern. It just is much more difficult than if you take the time to make sure you have the same die lot. That is the first part of secret number eight. The second part of secret number eight is simply matching up the way the colors line up. As you look down here, you can see that as I was coming along here, it could be that it's time for me to change my yarn. Maybe I came up with a knot. So what I do is I make sure that I have the same yarn and the same dye lot, and I will find a point in the working yarn that I'm using that the colors change. If that means I have to rip out to where, let's see here, right here you can see the gray turns to the flamingo color. I can get to that point and then I will grab my new ball of yarn and I'll find that same point in this new ball of yarn. So here it is, it's right here. So if I were to line up my new ball of yarn here, right up next to my working yarn, I can say, okay, about at that point, that's when my colors match up. So I could stop using my working yarn. Okay, so I'm gonna just move it out of the way. Let's move it out of the way. And I'm just holding this right up here and I'm pinching it right up next to where the stitch is. Now, because I don't like to join my yarn at a chain one, I'm gonna rip out one more, just partially. So I will put my hook in through this partially completed single crochet and we will join our yarn at that point. So here we are, this is where our yarn join, our matches up, okay, it matches up right there. I'll just come down here and instead of yarning over with my old yarn, which is right there, I'm simply going to yarn over with my new yarn and pull through, okay? So then I will drop my old yarn take my new yarn here, which is right here, and continue on with my pattern. So as I work here, I'm at my chain one, it comes a little loose here, I'm at my chain one, and I can see following along that this next stitch should be the, the flamingo color. So as I work, if it's flamingo, Perfect, it looks like it's doing all right. I can see a little bit of gray right there, so something that I can do is right here, I can just pop back to where I did my join, use the tail of the join, and just tighten that up a little bit, like move it. I'm just, I'm shifting it a little bit to shift this a little bit closer, so that way when I do my chain one, I have my all flamingo all the time. Okay, so the point here is that as you join your new yarn, it's okay to take the yarn tail that you just joined and maybe tug it a little bit for the first stitch to make sure that as you continue on, you're in the correct place, okay? Just because you joined it at one spot doesn't mean that that's the end all and be all. You can tug this tail a little bit to shift it over and then you would just carry on working with your working yarn here and complete your pattern maintaining the same number of stitches in each color as you work along. I want to talk about die lots just one more time here in secret number eight and then I won't mention them again until later on. Please make sure that if you're working on a singular project where you add a new ball of yarn, you do have the same die lot as the color you're using. And then I also wanna mention that there will be times that you, maybe you complete one project with this color and you start a whole new project with the same color but a different dye lot, you will get a different number of stitches in each color and it's just because of the way the yarn is dyed, okay? It's nothing you've done wrong, it's just that the yarn is dyed differently. So I'm just mentioning that so that way if those of you out there that are like, that's happened to me, it's totally fine, it's totally natural. You just might have to adjust the number of stitches you get in each color to make your successful. But you know how to do that because you have all of these secrets. Secret number nine is this. How do I make a project larger than a scarf? It's not difficult, you can do this. The first thing you're going to do is chain through your full color sequence a multiple of times. If you want your project to be a multiple of three color sequences wide, 
chain through three color sequences wide. If you want it five, chain through five. Do whatever you need to do to get through the full color sequence. I will let you know that this will use up quite a bit of yarn and you might have a long tail left over that you will undo and weave in later on, but it's a great way to make sure you've established that, okay, I need at least this much yarn to get through one full row. Once you've worked through the full number of color sequences you wanna use, you will then work your row one over the chains just like before. And you will also make sure you work the same number of stitches in each color. And you will also make sure that you do that color sequence the same multiple of times as you did your beginning chain. You will also want to make sure that in each color sequence, as you count the number of stitches in each color and you move on to the next color sequence, maintain those same number of stitches along the way. Just as when you work in a scarf and you maintain the same number of stitches in each color as you're moving up in the rows, you want to maintain that as you're working with multiples across the row. So if you have three gray, five white, three gray, eight black, I will start off again with three gray. Make sense? As long as you can maintain that down the row, you've then set up your row one for success just like you did on your scarf. Once you've done row one in that way, you would carry on using your moss stitch pattern and working the same way you did for your scarf, making sure that each color shifts over by one stitch every other row. You will continue to adjust your stitches as necessary, either making them bigger or smaller, or adjusting your turning chain amount, or changing the stitch completely into a half double crochet, maybe a half double crochet in a slip stitch, or maybe a partial puff stitch. Whatever you need to do to make sure those colors land in the correct place, you just keep doing that. Only now, instead of doing it over one color sequence, you're doing it over multiple color sequences. And that's how you can make something whiter, like a blanket. Secret number 10, you've made it. Here it is, are you ready? This is highly addictive. <laughs> Those of you who've already started off the planning pooling, the minute you get success, it's like, oh my gosh, what other yarn do I have in my stash that will make this uh, beautiful scarf or this beautiful blanket? Then the next thing you know, you're looking in your friend's stash. You're looking at all the stores that are local to you that sell yarn. You wanna buy all of the variegated yarns all the time. This is perfectly normal and to be expected as you're working with something that is so beautiful and really something super magical. Just as this is highly addictive, it can be equally as frustrating. There will be times that you are having great success with your planned pooling, and then all of a sudden you come across a yarn made in some particular dye lot that is just not happening for you, and you are fighting with the stitches the whole way. I want to let you know that it might not be you. It totally could be the yarn. Some dye lots are just a little bit more difficult than others. So don't let that make you throw in the towel and give up on this whole technique technique because it could be that there is a special yarn out there just for you waiting to be picked up and crocheted with this wonderful technique. Be a master of your yarn. Don't let the yarn defeat you. You control it. Make sure you use these 10 secrets and you will have successful plant pooling. Please be sure to share with me the projects that you're making with planned pooling. I would love to see them. If you share them with me on the Marley Bird Facebook page, I will see them no problem. It's just facebook.com forward slash Marley Bird. If you have a couple of secrets that you'd like to share with me to make our planned pooling even better, make sure you leave a comment below. Let us know what else we should be doing to make sure we have perfect planned pooling. While you're down there, would you mind smashing that like button to let other people know that you really enjoyed this video? I sure would appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna let you go and grab your yarn and your hook and do your plan pulling because I know you're just itching at it right now with all of this new information in your head. I wish you nothing but great success and I hope you will come back here for more videos on plan pulling and other crochet and knitting techniques. I'm Marley Bird, proud spokesperson for Red Heart Yarns and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Looking for more Marley Bird? Don't worry, I've got you covered. Click right down there and you will find more videos just like this teaching you how to knit or crochet, all brought to you by Red Heart Yarns. Go ahead, click away. Don't be shy. Don't forget to smash that like button.